I want to invite you to turn your Bibles, uh, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9 this morning. We continue in this book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, and as we go through diligently a chapter at a time, today is one of those days that a chapter is a lot to cover. There's really two different main sections in here, and I've broke it down into four points uh, and, and sum it all up with the, the title, Life Goes On. And there's so many ways we can take the term, the phrase, life goes on, isn't there? <laughs> you know, something bad happens, and people try to make you feel better, and they'll come up to you and they'll go, hey, it's okay, life goes on. Well, not if you're dead, <laughs> unless you're a Christian, and then you're in life everlasting, and so yeah, life does go on. See, there's twofold, life goes on just right there. Life goes on, and I'm going to start out with a point. We have four main points this morning, and the first of that is this. A renewed creation is provided with both blessings and rules. And so, kind of remembering where we're at in this story, we have Noah and his family. They have been rescued by God, saved from worldwide destruction. And then they've they've survived this over a year on the ark, and they've gotten off the boat, and at the first thing that that he does, that Noah does, and the rest of the families, they worship God, they build an altar to God and make sacrifices to God, and so we saw that last week. And now, now life begins again in this renewed earth. So a renewed creation, though what we're about to see, what God, in, what God gives is both blessing and instruction, blessing and rules. Kind of a, a retelling, not a retelling, but a, a recrafting of the creation account, but with some twists. So life goes on by the mercy of God for this family, Noah, his, his three sons and their wives, after having just destroyed arguably millions of people that lived on the earth before the flood. It's a very sobering time of life, a very wonderful time to recognize God's gracious hand was upon me and my family, if you were Noah and his family, to think God has rescued us. And here we are now, the only eight people on the planet. And if you remember, as chapter 8 concluded, we got insight into the mind of God, where where Moses, the author of the book of Genesis, recounts to us that God thought to himself, I will never curse the earth again like that. I will never strike down all living things as I have done in this case. There is a qualification to what he said to himself. And then chapter 9 picks up and continues this account of God, Noah, and the flood account. So chapter 9, verse 1 says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Does that sound familiar? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's, it should sound familiar. It's a renewed creation moment, and it is calling back to the original creation. God created man and woman and instituted this thing called marriage, and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That was their instruction. So God renews that command, that instruction to Noah, and it is a blessing that has been given. God shows his divine favor on Noah and his family as he says, you are blessed. You have my favor. You have divine, godly, positive disposition towards you. And, and when you think, I mean, a God who w- was willing and, and counted it necessary to bring the kind of destruction he just brought, to have God speaking blessing and hope and life, Oh, refreshing moment. But ultimate blessing is found in a close relationship with God. And this is what God calls Noah and his family into, this closeness with God. As he also tells them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It's all part of it. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Did you realize that children are a blessing from the Lord? Yeah, yeah, I know. And when we get pregnant, not that men get pregnant, but you know, when you're a married couple, you, you can say we are pregnant. That, that was a dud. All right. And, and 
But you can say, you get excited about that moment, and then the day of birth comes, and everyone's excited, you know, that's wonderful, and then, you know, three or four days in, and you've changed diapers 453 times, and you're kind of like, maybe it's not such a blessing after all, but it is. It's a blessing. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And when we are gifted children, we recognize these are, these are something from God. This is a blessing from God, these children of the Lord. And God tells them to repopulate the earth, to fill it up. And then he goes in and continues in this communication to Noah and his family after saying, be blessed, you're blessed, and be fruitful and multiply. Then verse 2, he continues, the Lord says, the fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth. Every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea, they are placed under your authority. Do you hear the creation account echoed here also? Not only be fruitful and multiply, but subdue the earth, be uh, over it in authority. But there's a uniqueness to this because now it, it doesn't say earlier that fear and terror of You, people, humans, are going to be in the animals, but before, it seems that there was a more uh, pleasant relationship between animals and humans. Um, Here, though, animals now, despite having been on the ark with Noah and his family, are going to fear mankind. And that's part of the blessing. I think it's a form of God's protection for humans that animals would fear Humans. I mean, look at the creation of animals that God has given, and look at the animals we have even now. Even in zoo, right, where animals are so domesticated, right? Ish. It's not like you want to get in the pen with the tiger. Right? So, so there is, like, they, if, if they were allowed to do whatever, humans don't really stack up well to certain animals when it comes to the threat that, that is, uh, which one is greater. Well, we have weapons, you know, in Texas, I know, y'all aren't scared of nothing. <laughs> All right, that's deer season, man, you know, <laughs> those, those critters are scared. You can't, you can't find them anywhere. What an interesting time now as they have disembarked from the ark and God speaks to them and tells them to be fruitful and multiply, but hey, these animals, they're going to live in fear and terror of you. And now all these animals, are, they're placed under your authority, so, so manage creation. Verse 3 says, every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. Now, the way this is worded and the way this is given, I kind of wonder if eating animals was not a thing before the flood. I cannot say with certainty, the scriptures do not say that they did eat meat, so you certainly could make the argument that they didn't, but it doesn't say that they did not either. But here, God, in this renewed creation moment, remember the original creation, did he give animals for food? Not not according to what he communicated, he gave every green plant and tree for for sustenance and food to humans, but, but not animals. Now, after the flood, animals also are food for people. Everything that lives and moves. I'll let you meditate on that in your own time. But he does give an instruction with that. So here's part of the blessing. You have this new food supply available to you that will help you and strengthen you. But you also, when you do eat the animal, don't eat it with the blood in it. Hmm. Does does God give some rules sometimes? You're just like, why? And sometimes you look at it and you go, yeah, I don't like meat with blood in it. It's better to be cooked all the way through, have that blood drained out. But he talks about this a little bit more in verse 5. He goes, and I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. You see, the, the way Scripture perceives it is that life is in the blood. 
And you should not, you should not take from the blood eat, eating meat with blood in it because it pertains to the life that God had given. Now again, I still don't understand why, how that picture makes complete sense. But then as he goes into this, he tells, if, if someone kills a human and, and ends their life, sheds their blood so that life ceases, then the punishment is death. It's a significant punishment, right? If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. So God is saying, by God's standards, if someone takes a life of another human being, then their life is required as penalty. That's significant. But does, is God the one who enforces that? Let's see verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed. For God made humans in his image. Wow. So God makes a penalty for when someone commits murder. And it is a, a new rule. Remember in, in creation, there was one rule for Adam and Eve. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Now, after the flood, new eight people, renewed earth moment. And God says, hey, there's going to be violence and murder, but there's got to be a penalty for it. God recognized that there was already violence in the human heart. And even though he sent this flood to wipe out all, those, all this wickedness, it was still in human hearts. So he creates a penalty for committing murder. And he says that humans are going to be the means by which you manage that. So God is really giving government the authority to apply capital punishment. He's not just giving people the right to go commit uh, revenge murders to avenge for the person that they lost. All chaos would ensue. And we see later on in Mosaic Law, God giving clarity in that even further. But he's just making this point, do not murder. And if you do, your life is the cost. It's the penalty. Why does God say this? Because there is intrinsic human value in humans, and he says it again in verse 6, for God made humans in his image. The only of God's creation to have been described in this way, to have been made in the image of God. And therefore, humanity has this special intrinsic value. He gave the authority to humans to eat any animal, which means you kill the animal, but... He does not give them the right and the freedom to take another human life. Why does God require such a harsh penalty? It's because there's so much value in what he created in humans. Because you are marring the image of God when you take somebody's life. You are saying, I get to be God and determine who lives and who dies. That's not okay. And you know, if you think about it, really, this is kind of the beginning of the pro-life movement. It's why we plead with our government who has been tasked with the responsibility of proper law and proper enforcement of the law. We, t we plead with our government to make and enforce laws to protect life, human life. And we believe as Christians, according to Scripture, that life begins in the womb, at conception. And when an abortion is performed, a life is ended. So we, we violate one of the simple laws that God gave to Noah and his family, which is to all humanity, by the way, with the renewed creation when we participate in an abortion. So many reasons that we will make and justify, but there's none to answer to God's instruction here. There's no excuse that works. And that's not to say that if you have had an abortion or if you've encouraged someone to get an abortion, that God doesn't love you and won't be gracious to you, as we're going to see in a few moments, the grace of God. So, so don't tune me out just yet. But we need to understand that human life is intrinsically valuable because God created us in his image. And really, he concludes this, this paragraph 
with this kind of on the contrary. Don't murder or your life will be required of you because man was made in the image of God, but you, verse 7, be fruitful and multiply. He already said be fruitful and multiply. Now he reiterates, hey, don't take life, but fill the earth. Make more life. Not about y'all, but this is one of those ones I get behind this commandment. Was that awkward for y'all? I mean, it's God's word. Be fruitful and multiply. Spread out over the earth and multiply on it. In contrast to murder and ending life, it's producing it. It is to multiply. Now, here's a fun one, guys. The word multiply is the same word used in chapter 1 in creation where it talked about let the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea multiply and team, T-E-E-M, which means swarm. Do you follow what I'm saying? This American ideal of, you know, mom, dad, two and a half kids. That doesn't sound like teeming to me. It's not a swarm of children. So, so we got some work to, no, I'm, I'm going I'm to keep on, I'm going to move on. But, but take a note of this, of this instruction to, to be fruitful and multiply. And not only that, but one that wasn't mentioned in creation was spread out over the earth spread out. So that's part of God's instruction. It's not just a good idea. It's an instruction. It's a command. Multiply and spread out. And you know what's kind of interesting? I think it, it's happened throughout different moments in history. There have been people that are afraid of, of over, overpopulating the earth. Do you realize that the entire population of the earth could fit in the state of Texas today? And more of the fear of overpopulation is not so much space as it is producing food, but look at how God has also brought up technology and innovation so that food could be produced in such a way that it it supplies the world's population at right now, what, 8 billion-ish people. So don't worry about overpopulation. Trust God with that and multiply and fill the earth. All right, that's what Noah was instructed to do. So we see this renewed covenant that came with blessing and it came with instruction and warning. Point number two before we go into this next section is this. A covenant, which is what we're about to talk about, covenant, is established in this case that we're about to look at by the everlastingly faithful God, the title of last week's message, because God is faithful. He is unchanging, and He is everlastingly that way. So when God makes a promise, which is a word I'm going to interchange for covenant a little bit, He will follow and uphold his word. But life goes on. Life goes on, and it's going to go on until the time of final judgment. No more taking out the whole earth until the right time comes for final judgment. God resolved within himself. Without a negotiation with people, he resolved within himself that reality, that he would not destroy the whole earth that way, by flood. So what's crazy about that is we have a God that can tell you the future and has the power to make the future happen, as he said. Unlike us humans, I could promise to take my family to ice cream tomorrow, but my car could break down, my legs could break down, and we I could try everything in my power, but it it is possible that it is outside of my power to get to ice cream tomorrow. A covenant is established by the everlastingly faithful God. Verse 8 says, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you And if you will just kind of do a little logical, boom, 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 that's us, descendants of Noah. Verse 10, and with every living creature that is with you. So God is making a covenant not only with humanity, but with the animals. 
Every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. He says in verse 11, summary, I established my covenant with you that never again, never again, will every creature be wiped out by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. So twice in these four verses, God declares, I establish my covenant with you. I'm establishing it. I establish it. It's done. Let's talk about a covenant for a second. Now, I mentioned the word promise earlier, but it's more than a promise. A covenant is a relational agreement that binds two parties together relationally. And, and functionally, depending on what the agreement is about, and it is a legally binding agreement. And it is not like a contract. Contracts are legally binding agreements also. Many of us have experienced legal contracts. If you ever bought a car, bought a home, right? you, you signed a contract in which they provided something, usually a bank, and you provided something, the promise to make a payment month after month until that payment is complete, plus interest, right? In a covenant, there is not necessarily an obligation on both parties. There could just be on one party, or depends on the covenant. So we can look at this one. We look at the different blessings and benefits and rights and privileges of a covenant along with responsibilities and obligations. These covenants, a covenant kind of contract or a covenant kind of relationship was so significant that, that people would often establish a covenant by taking an animal, cutting it in half. Okay, that means it's dead. And they would lay both halves on the, on the ground in front of them and both parties who were agreeing to the covenant would walk through the middle to the other side to indicate, if I don't uphold my end of this, then may what happened to that animal be what happens to me. That's pretty serious. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be split in half. It's a big deal. And the parties involved in this covenant that God makes with Noah, or God, on one side of the covenant... And on the other side of the covenant, we have Noah and his descendants, and that includes all of us and every living human on the planet and everyone that's lived since Noah, as well as every living creature that came out of the ark, the birds, the, the cre creatures that crawl, I think you even said the fish of the sea, like everybody, all these living creatures are in this covenant on this side, God's on that side. And the benefits of this covenant, the benefits are, I'll never wipe all of you out with flood water again. Well, that's a pretty, okay. Okay, God, what do we humans have to do? And you might think if this was more contractual where, where we were to do something, God would probably want to say something like, y'all stop sinning. Stop breaking my law. Stop murdering people. Stop hating people. Stop stealing stuff from people. You could go on, right? Does God expect anything from Noah in establishing this covenant or from the creatures? No. Just be. And because I've established it, this is the way it's going to be. So we have these great benefits, this, this blessing, this privilege of this covenant of what God is saying. That the one who has the power to wipe out every creature by floodwaters every time he wanted to, every time we reach a certain level of wickedness or whatever, he says, I'm not going to do that. And I'm making that a covenant statement, not just a statement, but a covenant statement. And the elements and the requirements of that covenant were entirely on God to perform. Absolutely nothing that man or creature has to do to uphold our end of the covenant. So, this is interesting. God makes this binding promise to humanity. And what the reason for in this is we are intended to see the grace of God. He knows that humanity is jacked up. Remember when he was talking to himself at the end of the last chapter, chapter 8? Remember, remember when he said, I know that every inclination of the human heart is evil 
from youth onward. Yeah, I get the sin nature, God says, but I'm still establishing this covenant. And I think this gives us a picture of the covenant that God makes with people today through Christ. Because in the covenant, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament thing, you realize testament is another word for covenant. So old covenant versus new covenant. And the new covenant really just fulfills all the old. It doesn't do away with it. It fulfills it. And in the new covenant, the new testament, which is Jesus' blood. Remember when we do communion and and he says, take this blood that I have shed for you as you drink the grape juice to remind you of that blood, that this is my blood shed for you for the new covenant in my blood. It's a covenant. God sacrificing his son Jesus on the cross was a covenant God was making with humanity. Those who would receive by faith, that's our obligation. That's it, receive by faith. But God does all the work, all the responsibility, all the obligation of justly dealing with sin so that you can't take two payments for the same thing. Jesus took the full payment. So he doesn't exact that punishment from us also because then he would be unjust in claiming that. It's a covenant we enter into because God reaches out because of what Christ did towards us and we simply receive by faith. God's grace through faith. And we don't get that sometimes. I think we, again, we think contractual We think, okay, God is offering this eternal life. That sounds really great. Heaven, place with streets that are gold. I mean, if your asphalt is made of gold, it's a pretty cool place. And where there's there's the tree of life and this river flowing out, so there's plenty of everything that you need to, to live eternally, to glorify God, to see this beautiful, wonderful place. Awesome. I want that. Okay, God, you, I will do my, I will, I will, surrender my life and do this, 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 and that. But it's not a contract. You see, we enter into that relationship, and now we might go, God, I'm so amazed by you. I'm so thankful for how you have purchased me when I was unlovely, when I couldn't do anything to earn it. And God, you can have my life. What do you want from me? But every time that we we fail, we sin, we stumble along the way, it's not God going to go, Oh, you have failed. I strike you. You're out. See, it's a covenant that we can't, we we don't have the power to break. Praise God. So we're intended to see the grace and the compassion of God. We're intended to see a, a picture of a coming covenant that God would make through his son Jesus, through the shedding of his blood for us. Awesome. Verse 12, Genesis chapter 9, continues. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all future generations. Here's the, here's the sign. Here's the evidence, the reminder that I'm going to keep my word. A sign points to something beyond itself. And to just illustrate that briefly, if you were to see a sign for Chick-fil-A, because everybody loves Chick-fil-A, right? You don't stop at the sign for Chick-fil-A to get a Chick-fil-A sandwich. But what you know is that's, a, that's evidence, that's a reminder, there is a Chick-fil-A 15 minutes down the road. If I want my chicken sandwich and my waffle fries and a large sweet tea, which I don't do sweet tea, but a lot of y'all do. It's East Texas. Why do I say stuff like that? I, we're, all right, let's go to verse 13. All right, it's a, it's a constant reminder. God is saying, I'm going to give you this sign as a reminder for me, a reminder for you that I'm going to keep my word and keep this covenant. Verse 13, here's the sign. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I form clouds over the earth and the, and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures. Water will never again become a flood to destroy every creature. Cool. 
the bow, verse 16, the bow will be in the clouds and I will look at it and remember the permanent covenant between God and all the living creatures on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established. There's a third, I've established the covenant, by the way. And when God says something three times, do you think it means something? If he says it twice, you better pay attention. If he says it three times, dude, it's established beyond doubt. And this covenant that I've established is between me and every creature on the earth. Let's talk about this for a second. What is a bow? I've placed my bow in the clouds. How do we perceive of this? This is a rainbow. Yes. That is how we, and it's right to interpret it that way. But do you know what this word means? It means bow. Now, I know there's some hunters in here. Are you getting where I'm going with that? Bow. Bow. That's the word that's used. It is, it is saying, I, I'm going to take my, my weapon, the bow, and I'm going to hang it in the clouds. When a warrior comes home from battle with his weapons that he has carried into battle, and, and you're in time of peace, what do you do with your weapon? What's the phrase that we use? We hang it up, Right? God is hanging up the weapon of choice to destroy all of humanity with a flood by hanging up his bow. But what's interesting about the bow of the rainbow, if you look at the bow and it's hanging up, isn't that kind of the backwards way to hang up a bow? No, a bow is, is uh, well, let me rephrase that. A rainbow is actually a big circle. Did you know that? But humanly, our perspective, we can only see the curvature in most cases from the earth. And, and that, that bow creates this angle that if you have the string attached, where does that arrow point? Heavenward. And as if to, to give us an indication that in the covenant, God understands that he's going to be the one in the next one, in the new covenant, to be sacrificed, to be punished for the wickedness of humanity rather than earth. Now, that's, uh, that is taking a concept there and, and adding a thought that just seems, wow. Don't be careful when we interpret things like that. But nonetheless, every time you see a rainbow in the sky, it truly is still today, because it says it's a permanent reminder that God remembers, oh yeah, I'm not going to flood the entire earth again. My grace is for these people. And you know, when you think about billions of people that have lived between then and now, and, and how wicked the earth has been in that time, war and atrocity and genocide and horrible things humans do to each other, I mean, the grace of God is beyond comprehension. I don't think I'd put up with it. I don't do well putting up with a bad umpire. <laughs> I'm just being real. I'm doing my best. I'm trying to maintain my Christian character, but I, thank God I'm not God. Thank God that God is so gracious towards us. And I want to also point out rainbows, when we see them, and, and in Noah's case, when he saw it, it was after the storm. How many of you have been through the storm or going through the storm of life that you think I could die or I should die? This is, I just don't even deserve to live. And yet, after all of that, after God does this incredible storm, then there's this hope of life and a promise that will come on a regular basis and remind him of that. Not that God, not that God forgets, but it's a reminder to us of the covenant that he made that he won't change. And he won't break. What an incredible thing. And yet today, isn't it just like Satan to hijack the powerful good things of God? Because if you see a rainbow today, is your first thought about the covenant that God made with Noah? I, I hope it is. But let's be honest, in our world, if you see a rainbow today, it, it implies something else. Leprechauns. Leprechauns. And a pot of gold. That's not it. All right, I got to keep going. Verse 18 says, Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
It tells us, interestingly, interestingly, the son of Ham here, Ham was the father of Canaan, it doesn't give any other offspring yet, but it's, I think, for the purpose of the next story in this chapter, which we need to cover today. But it says in verse 19, these three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. Noah's sons. Shem, whose name means celebrated or distinguished. Ham, whose name means heat, hot, or even dark, maybe a dark heat. Canaan, who is the grandson of Noah, son of Ham, is a a merchant trader, uh, meaning of his name, servant, lowly, to be humbled. And I wonder if the point of this is beginning to, to communicate with us that through that particular line, there is a corrupt ancestry that will have lasting ramifications with God's people. The family of Abraham, who comes from Shem, are at pretty serious odds with those that come from Ham, particularly Canaan. You do recall that God promised land from the land of Canaan to Abram when he calls him out and promises to bless him. And yes, there is much heartache. But Noah does not appear to have any other children. Oh, I, mentioned, I should mention Japheth. His, his name means enlargement or may God open. And we see the, the offspring of Japheth being broadly uh, expanding over the earth. We're going to see in the next chapter. We call it the table of nations in chapter 10. It's going to be riveting going through another genealogy next week. I just hope you'll come back and have a great time with us on that. But you know what? Jesus is found in each of these passages. The hope of salvation is found in these passages. But now we move into the second part of this chapter. And our point number three is this. Evil in the human heart continues wreaking havoc to this day. Believe it or not, there's sin in Noah. Noah has been described as a righteous man for the last couple of chapters. A man who was blameless, who walked with God, and yet Noah has sin. Their sin and his son, and all of his sons for that matter, but their sin in Ham, their sin in Canaan, their sin in everyone. And so life goes on, but it goes on with evil and corruption within it. And evil and corruption bring some painful consequences and some shameful realities. I just want to remind you of what God said in chapter 8, verse 21, as we read the next few verses. So chapter 8, verse 21 says, When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of that sacrifice that Noah had made, he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings. But note this, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. God, aware of that, now we come to this moment, chapter 9, verse 20. Noah, as a man of the soil, began by planting a vineyard. That makes sense. Now, the commentators are goofy. I don't know. Do you ever read commentaries on Bible stuff? Like, I read so many paragraphs of different commentaries trying to describe why he built a vineyard and, and was there vineyard and alcohol before the flood and, and, or is it just after the flood? And you know what? Who cares? He apparently knew what to do. He planted a vineyard. This is grapes which he's going to produce wine from intentionally, which means that some time has passed too, by the way, from their disembarking from the, the ark. Now some time has passed and, and, and time to plant a vineyard, time to grow that, to produce wine. That takes some time. But Noah, you, you'll notice this. Noah, as a man of the soil, again, calls us back to the creation account. Adam was a man of the soil also, literally created from the ground. So when it says soil and Adam was created from the ground, it, it's the same word. You could say Adam was created from the soil or Noah was a man of the ground. or whichever the, the words are the same word. So Adam was created from the soil. Noah was a man of the soil. Adam worked the soil. Noah worked the soil. So we have a new Adam. Is it going to be different this time? Is it going to be better And as we think about the soil and the earth, we think Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, actually, first we're reminded of the blood-stained soil of Abel, whom Cain murdered. We're reminded of the hope of Noah when, when 
Lamech, his dad, fathered Noah, because in Genesis 5, 29, he says, he named him Noah, saying, this one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground, the soil the Lord has cursed. So Noah was supposed to bring rest, and in a sense he does. Again, he's a picture of Christ and salvation, but he is not Christ, and he is a sinful man, as we see in verse 21. He drank some of the wine. I'm not calling that sin, according to Scripture, but this next two words are, he became drunk. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and then he added to his sin in this and uncovered himself inside his tent. To uncover, that's a, that's a very kind, polite way of English translating Hebrew saying he got naked. He exposed himself in his tent and appears to pass out, to fall asleep, exposed. Being drunk and becoming drunk was probably not, you know, again, this is where the commentaries are funny because they want to argue, well, maybe Noah didn't know that if he drank that much, he'd get drunk. Yeah, no, I don't buy that. Drunkenness has some really ill effects, guys. If you and your household, you seek the Lord and you feel that there's freedom to drink alcohol, please, please never let yourself be drunk. And by the way, you know what they say in the commercials, warning you not to drink and drive, they say buzzed driving is drunk driving. So if you go, well, I didn't really, I just, I just got a little buzz. Just, guys, it's dangerous. Be careful. Drunk, uh, alcohol, drunkenness has, has destroyed so many families. And this sin of Noah begins, it, it causes and brings about this event that is very difficult. Verse 22 says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Now again, in English, this is a little bit kind of just bland and you don't really realize what's going on. He saw his father naked. Now you wouldn't think that that's a crime or a sin, right? He stumbled, he came into the tent and, oh, right? Would that have been, would that have been a sin? Do you think God would have applied to his account? No, I don't know. I don't think so. But he came in and he sees his father naked and then he tells his brothers outside, this word tells that he told his brothers indicates this idea of, of, of delighting in what he's about to tell his brothers. Oh, I got, a, I got a juicy secret. Can't wait. Hey guys, come here, come here. I got this. You got to know. Oh man, this is, yeah, our practically perfect dad who God keeps calling righteous and everything, who walks with God, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he's drunk and naked. Ha, ha, ha. Come take part and add to the shame of our father by, by looking upon his shame with me. That's what Ham is doing. And God sees that as an evil thing. And, and so we see the response of Shem and Japheth in verse 23. They don't do what he is calling them to do. They take a cloak and they placed it over both of their shoulders. So one on one side, one on the other, and they walk backward into the father's tent. They covered their father's nakedness and they kept their faces turned away so that they wouldn't expose his shame. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father naked. They refused to allow themselves to see their dad's nakedness. And it is in complete contrast to Ham who wanted to make sport of it, who wanted to make light of it and mockery of it. And by the way, we know a future Ten Commandment, which is honor your father and mother. Ham is not doing that. Shem and Japheth are. Verse 24 says, When Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, My grandson be cursed. Hmm? Where was Canaan? Do y'all have the answer for this one? Okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you some thoughts. He said, let me finish reading the verse. He said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. And let me also point out this. In the entire flood narrative from Genesis chapter 6 to Genesis chapter 9, do you realize these are the only recorded words of Noah here in the next few verses? 
All the rest was talking about Noah, but none of them are what Noah himself said. Isn't that interesting? And, and it's almost kind of a last will and testament. Like these are, the, the final prayer of Noah is this. But let's ask this question. Why does, why does Noah curse his grandson, not his son, who committed this act of shameful mockery? It is possible. You remember how the chapter began, God blessed Noah and his three sons, that there was something in Noah that said, I I can't curse someone that God has blessed. But I think it's also somewhat prophetic as he anticipates, again, the spirit of God through Noah, anticipating the strife that would be between the future descendants of of Canaan and Shem. Remember, Israel descends from Shem. Canaan takes over the promised land. In fact, Ham's descendants, not only Canaan, but they even take over Egypt. Uh, And the Bible tells us that. Did you know that? Uh, Psalm 78 verse 51 is the account of the Exodus is recounted for us. It tells us in verse 51 of Psalm 78, he struck all the firstborn in Egypt. That's God striking all the firstborn in Egypt. The first progeny of the tents of Ham. So, so Egyptians were from the line of Ham. Psalm 105 verse 23 also tells us that Israel went to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. So in all of this, there is this curse for Canaan. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. doesn't mean that he's always a slave to his brothers, though, does it? Because he, he, Israelites became slaves to the Egyptians. which makes us more of a prayer than a prophecy. And we see the next verse is continuing that way. But before I get there, the fourth point this morning, the Lord continues authoring the greatest story ever told, the story of salvation. See, life will go on eternally for those who receive the gift of salvation. Life will go on. God has authored the story of salvation and it is being told even in this chapter of Genesis that is so difficult. But Noah, as he he spoke about Canaan and his descendants, now he speaks about Shem. Listen to verse 26. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. You see that, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And and this is more of a prayer, a a wish, a request of God, not a prophecy. Noah sees and he prays for that special relationship between God and his son Shem, which we see played out later with Abraham, who is of the line of Shem, who God makes a special covenant relationship with, from whom Jesus descends on the bloodline side. Now, some make an argument that there's a a case here for the ethnic or racial curse that that Ham must have been the darker skinned people, and therefore all that's why we have this thing with blacks being enslaved. No, we have no true evidence of of whether that meant black or ethnic people. Simply that there was this expectation, this prayer that. Canaan and the offspring of Ham who had done this evil, that they would be a slave to God's chosen people, God's special relationship. Verse 27 says, let God extend Japheth. So again, that let, that's a request, that's a wish, that's a desire. It's not a prophecy, but these do come about in several ways. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. So he's making Canaan slave to all of them in his prayer. And and later in the next chapter, we learn that Japheth's family settles in Asia Minor and Europe. So when you ask the question, how does Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem? I think we see an early reference to the gospel to the Gentiles. Partly in that Japheth's offspring are the people from whom we have the Greeks. And the Greeks 
have this language that takes over the whole world, the whole known world, and the whole New Testament is written in Greek. And when the people, uh, the Jews, remember how they start, they start to spread the gospel, the message of salvation in Christ that started with the Jews in Jerusalem, and then it kind of went outward to Samaria, and then you get even further outward beyond to the ends of the earth, and we have the apostle Paul who takes the gospel to the Gentiles. We have the apostle Peter who takes the gospel to Gentiles as well, and God making the gospel the special relationship with people being those that believe by faith not bloodline. So Japheth's family that he extended, those Gentiles that come to faith and enter into the Shem's tent, the tent where God provided salvation. It's pretty cool. Verse 28 says, Now Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so Noah's life lasted 950 years. Then he died. So Noah ends the family record of Seth, the Seth line from Adam, not ends as in no longer exists, but he ends this, he is the 10th from Adam and ends this first big family record in, as chapter 9 comes to an end. Noah lived 950 years and then he died. See, life goes on until it doesn't, unless you're in Christ unless you've received the grace of God, and then life will go on eternally. But if you die apart from Christ, when this life over, is over and you breathe your last, life does not go on. It is eternal death, separation from God, and torturous. And I think the greater torture is the separation from God, not the pain that it seems to imply. Well, explicitly read. And it's fascinating here, Noah, it, it gives that he lived 950 years and then he died. And in the line of Adam through Seth all the way down to Noah, each person that died, it says he lived to be this, you know, how many years old? He fathered other sons and daughters and then he died. But here, it doesn't say anything about Noah fathering other sons and daughters, so I don't think We have any reason to believe that Noah fathered any other sons and daughters. That all future children were from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their wives, their sons and daughters, and so forth. I want to point out a few similarities. I've already mentioned several, but Noah and Adam's similarities. They shared the same profession. They were workers of the soil. They were farmers. They both shared the command to fill the earth, to be fruitful and multiply. Both experienced sinning, And then coming with that is the shame of nakedness. Both transgressions resulted in serious family strife. Murder for one of Adam's sons, slavery for Noah's youngest, and more violence and harm between families, tribes. The point is the human heart remained the same, absolutely in need of a Savior. So as we look at this book of beginnings, we'll point out this is the beginning of the first formal covenant known. You could argue there's a covenant with Adam, but this is the first one that God says, I'm making my covenant, it is established with you. A covenant that reveals the gracious nature of God, the one who will never break his word, the salvation providing God. And as we remember that sin is pervasive, that it wreaks havoc on humanity and the relationships in humanity, and we realize that evil has so corrupted the human heart ever since it entered the world through Adam, we recognize what Scripture says, that all have sinned. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then we remember in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. What we've earned, that's a contract. I commit sin, I get paid death. Life doesn't go on when sin rules. But that verse, praise God, Romans 6.23 doesn't end for the wages of sin is death. It ends, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. 
the gift. Yes, we need a gracious God to provide our need of salvation. A gift. A gift you cannot earn. The moment it's earned, it's a wage. It's a payment for what you've done. It's not even deserved because you're special. Because then there's an obligation to give it. But a gift is a loving, gracious act from our faithful, covenant-making, covenant-keeping, Yahweh, Lord God Almighty, through His Son, Jesus. So as we look at this event, this renewed creation, this reality that sin still persists in our hearts, we also see a Savior and a gracious God that we humble ourselves before and believe. So draw near to Him today. Tomorrow and forever. What a gracious thing that God would gift us salvation. And I just I want to ask you if you have if you've thought of salvation as something that you earn by your works, if I were to ask you if you were to die today and you'd stand before God and, and ask, are you guilty or innocent? And God says, well, according to his law, we're guilty. Why should I let you into heaven? If your answer to that is, well, I think God will look at my life and he'll see more good than bad, then I'm saying you don't understand the gift. And you also don't understand your own sin. The sin and evil in our hearts is so pervasive and it's so blinding to us that we don't even recognize that if we weighed good and bad, this is good, this is bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> I made it sound like, you know what I mean. I think you tracked with me. There's a lot more weight on the bad. We get this one so messed up. Grace. God's grace is a gift. It's a covenant gift. Embrace Him. And know you're forgiven. And walk with Him in the delight of a Savior who gives such good gifts. Father, I pray that you would grant us understanding. We need it. Father, I need it. I know my own tendency as an, as an accidental and recovering Pharisee to be delighted in, in creating these rules and boundaries that I live by, and I think that because I've done those, I feel righteous, but I'm not. In and of myself, I am unrighteous. In fact, my righteousness, as you describe them in Isaiah, my, my best is, is filthiness before you and in comparison to your righteousness. So I, I pray that you would help me to understand. I pray you would help us to understand your gift of salvation, this clothing us with the righteousness of Jesus that that we stand now close so when you look at us, you don't compare good and bad. You see the righteousness of Jesus. And you say, welcome into rest. Welcome into eternal life when we stand before you one day. According to your word, and God, you've shown you keep your word. So God, I pray you'd help us to understand it better. And if we need to ask the questions about it, if we need to seek you in a way that we, do, we stop putting the emphasis on what we're doing, but we put our eyes on you, the gracious gift-giving, salvation-giving God, I pray we would move today as we ought to. And that may be coming to you in faith for the very first time, and it may be, God, helping correct my thinking because I've been in church for a long time. But God, I pray you would draw us closer to you to recognize the covenant nature that you keep your promises and it's not dependent upon our work. 
So thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the account of Noah and his family. Thank you for the righteousness that you clothe us in in Christ that we receive by faith. We trust you and say, God, you're God. I need you. And I enter into this relationship that you have made possible. So I cry out to you in the name of Jesus this morning, asking you to keep your work going all throughout this day, all throughout this week, all throughout eternity. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.